Hi, welcome to the week nine forum. Uh, this week we are looking at chapter eight, um, which is uh, political parties and interest groups. Uh, these are another example of sort of the intermediary institutions that help uh, connect citizens, help create sort of an interest articulation uh, between uh, you know individualized citizens and uh, the you know the, the the institutional branches of government. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about what parties are, uh, how party identification uh, guides voters. We're going to talk a little bit about electoral realignments uh, and how uh, you know periodically one party will be dominant within the electorate and then uh, that will that will shift. Then we'll talk a little bit about interest groups and uh, how they are comprised, and then uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what interest groups do. Okay, so the main uh, interests here. We want you to be able to define political parties and their functions. We want you to be able to identify the reasons for and the sources of party identification and increased party polarization in American politics. We want you to be able to describe the U.S. Uh, party systems and the influence of third parties. We want you to be able to describe the major types of interest groups and who they represent. And we want you to be able to explain how interest groups try to influence government and policy. So when you think about what government is and, and why it matters, um, the, the, the story at the, at the beginning of this chapter is about a young woman named Ke uh, Kelly uh, Carinder. Uh, and, and really her story sort of highlights uh, both the ways in which political parties and interest groups are similar and the, way in, the ways in which they fundamentally are different. Uh, so on the one hand, Kelly Carinder uh, is a Seattle conservative blogger, and, and she really was uh, somebody that helped to launch the Tea Party movement in, in 2009 and 2010. For those of you who don't know what the Tea Party meant, it was an acronym for Taxed Enough Already. And so it was an, basically a, you know, a protest movement against uh, Barack Obama's uh, domestic policies, especially... Uh, the Affordable Care Act, and the, basically the you know the the second aspect of the uh, of the, the subprime mortgage meltdown kind of bailout uh, those processes. So, <clears throat> Carinder basically committed a lot of time and effort to launching what she called a porculous protest, uh, and that got the attention of other higher profile conservatives. Uh, the, the point here is that, first and foremost, interest groups and political parties are fundamentally different. Uh, they're different in terms of their ends, right, which is to say uh, political parties want to seize control of government by winning elections. Uh, interest groups are more interested in influencing public policy and are less interested uh, in, in, you know, focusing on fundamental change in government. And so to some extent, the first thing you can say about parties is that, especially in this country, they are innately majoritarian in nature. They want to win control of institutions. Uh, that means winning with the majority of votes in, in elections and then the majority of the seats in the political institutions. Um, so interest groups are typically more interested just in getting things from government and lobbying government and figuring out ways of, of getting government to do what they want. It's also important to keep in mind that, that political parties fundamentally in the United States are alliances of interest groups. And so uh, that again reflects an important difference uh, between political parties and interest groups. Okay, So uh, people that, that manage and, and people that lobby on behalf of interests uh, are, are behaving in a fundamentally distinctive way uh, when they lobby the government, okay? Uh, but they do also engage in, you know, campaign-related activities, okay? <clears throat> so, um, when we think about political parties, again, their mission is to win control uh, of, of political offices. Uh, and, and, you know, historically, our political parties, we've typically had to that were that had real chances of winning elections, uh, but for most of our history, uh, the political parties were not themselves what I would call ideological parties. Uh, it's really not until well into the 20th century that you begin seeing 
the Democratic Party becoming increasingly a liberal party, a welfare liberal party, if you will, and the Republican Party increasingly becoming a conservative ideological party. And that's had far-reaching uh, implications. It's, it's made governance a lot more difficult because as the parties have become more and more ideologically consistent, um, their, their view of the other party has tended to become uh, more polarized and, and less uh, amenable to compromise, okay? The, 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 you know, the general tendency today uh, for Republicans and for Democrats is to view a win by the other side as necessarily a loss for their side. There's very little that takes place in politics that doesn't have that kind of zero-sum calculation attached to it. So regardless of if you want, you know, immigration reform or if you want uh, to outlaw abortion, you know, any of these kinds, you know, th these kinds of issues where if one party wins, there's no, there is no compromise perspective here. The perspective is that the one party is winning and imposing their view on the other. And that's making it very hard to govern. And, and that is also having an impact uh, on our uh, interest group uh, system as well. The interest groups are, you know, sitting outside of government and constantly making demands. And again, they're pulling government in various uh, directions that, are, again, have that kind of zero-sum nature to it. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about in this little mini-lecture is why the United States has a two-party system. If you, if you look at the, you know, the, the origin point of uh, American politics, it's, it tends to focus on this kind of two-sided uh, conversation, uh, the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists. Um, and again, that, that, that has had an impact uh, on the, the shape uh, of the party system that would emerge. It's important to keep in mind the original, the, the, you know, the, the founding generation, uh, most of them were kind of hostile to the notion uh, of, uh, of political parties. Um, George Washington, in his farewell address, warned against the spirit of faction, uh, which, by which he meant political parties. Uh, nevertheless, a two-party system very quickly emerged uh, within the Washington administration. You had uh, Thomas Jefferson, who would later kind of help form uh, the Democratic-Republican Party uh, in the early days of the 19th century. And then you had people like, uh, like John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, who were clearly Federalists. And so, you know, this sort of, you know, sets the stage for what was happening. So why do we have a two-party system today? To some extent, it's the, sort of the tradition of our, of our discourse, but most importantly, it's written into the Constitution and in the way that the constitutional rules governing federal elections have been interpreted. And what I mean by that is that by creating a system in the House in which there are multiple districts in each state and each, each district elects only one person uh, that's, that really provides a powerful shaping influence. And, and you know, basically, uh, for a political party to survive in the United States, they have to be able to control enough states to be able to survive through, you know, multiple bad election cycles. Third parties form. Uh, and, the, and the problem historically has been that one of the two major parties manages to co-opt the, the primary issue uh, that is motivating uh, that third party formation. Of course, uh, the Republican Party was once a minor party. Uh, it stole the issue of slavery uh, from the Free Soil Party and from other third parties and basically was able to, to co-opt it. Uh, the same sort of thing happened, uh, you know, in the early days uh, of, uh, you know, of, of the Great Depression, where again, Republican, you know, de well, Democrats, I should say, uh, kind of stole a lot of the the, the program uh, from more leftist, po you know, leftist political advocates, and really that became the backbone of the New Deal programs. Uh, likewise, I can say the same thing in the 1990s. Uh, the big issue that seemed to be galvanizing huge numbers of Americans was the problem of the debt and deficit spending. And what ultimately happened was. Ross Perot formed a party around that idea, and you know Bill Clinton stole it from him, and, and ultimately was able to, you know, 
persuade enough voters to say that the Democratic Party will be the responsible party. And that, you know, that was a promise that he largely tried to commit uh, and, and did a lot to reduce deficit spending. And we were actually by around 2000 beginning to, uh, you know, pay down our debt. So that, you know, that's a, a significant thing. In any event, these are two very important topics. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise them in the, in the forum. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer them if, if I can. So let's have a great week.